worship the Lord this morning.
announcement uh, to those of you that are of course watching with us if you want to know more about our ministry uh, check out our website jilfnj.org and also our Facebook and YouTube we have one name it's Jesus is Lord Fellowship uh, Tom's River you can like you can share and you can subscribe also watch our daily Bibles versus verses it's just a six minutes video of the Word of God just to encourage you and to inspire you for the day uh, we live in a very tumultuous and, and predictable times and we just need the Word of God to refresh our soul and spirit, believing that God is faithful, God is faithful, and God is faithful. Amen. Also, we would like to continuously ask every one of you, please join us in our daily prayers from Monday all the way to Saturday, 7 to 8 p.m. daily. 
as we get into the presence of the Lord, uh, we have just passed through the six months of this pandemic, and things are looking a little bit brighter, while we're still under the canopy of unpredictability and uncertainty. So we would like to continuously ask God to protect us, to shield us, and to encourage us at the same time. And to those of you that may uh, that you may have needs and burdens, please uh, drop us a note on our website, that drop us a note on our social media, and tell us about what's going on with your life. Tell us what's going on with your family or any burden that you may have. We would love to agree with you in prayer, expecting miracle to happen. And also you can call 732-901-7733. Uh, on our giving, to those of you that are giving online, you can go to jilf.org slash give, jilfnj.org slash give. You can give online, and uh, you can also send us by mail. You can look at the screen, and uh, you see the address. And also to those of you that are with us this morning, uh, not only we welcome you, but we welcome your love offering and the goodness of your heart as an express of the fruits of your labor in our offering box. Let me read to you Acts chapter 20, verse 32 to 38. The, uh, the back story of this was when, when Paul finally, finally decided to defend his case, not only before the Sadducees and Pharisees, the religious people, but he wanted to defend his, himself and to defend his, you know, his, uh, his belief in the Lord. And so he asked for an audience before the ruler of of Rome, and there he was. He was he was bringing he was being uh, brought to Rome as a prisoner. And in Acts chapter twenty, verse thirty-two, this is what he said: Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved, him, what grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to his ship. Now it's incredible, a word of exhortation and impartation as he said goodbye to the rest of the brothers and sisters in Christ in Israel, in Jerusalem. Paul uh, faced his death, but one thing he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let me read this to you as well from Charles Spurgeon. This is what he said. Earn all you can, save all you can, and then give all you can. Never try to save out of God's cost. Such money will canker the rest. Giving to God is no loss. It is putting your substance into the best bank. Giving is true give a habit. As the gravestone said of the dead man, What I spent, I had. What I saved, I lost. And what I gave, I had. Will you just kindly raise up your offering this morning? Uh, to those of you that are here this morning, uh, you know that what you give to God is the representation not you, of your wallet, not your pocketbook, not your account, but it's the representation of who you are. So whether you're giving partially, you're giving wholeheartedly, or you're not giving at all, whatever is the disposition of your heart this morning, what you give and do not give represents who you are. So remember that what we give to God is an extension of who we are. Father, we ask and we pray that allow us to reconcile with our giving. Allow us, Lord God, to understand, Lord God, what we give is who we are. And so, Father, our fruits of labor, Lord God, is part of your blessing each day, Father. Six days we toil, we work. You give us the health, the strength, the guidance, the ability to produce wealth, to be creative, to be innovative, to be intellectual, Lord God. Lord God, our hands are protected and shielded and strengthened by you, Father, so that each day as we wake up, we are still have the capacity, Lord God, Father, to produce wealth and great harvest, God. And so bless our giving this morning, Father. We thank you that you're faithful, O God. We thank you for the reality that, Lord God, you can give, Lord God, 
And Father God, uh, you give more than what, what we can ever give for the rest of our lives. We thank you and honor you, and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'd like to also officially announce this morning that on October 4th, we are going to have a congregational meeting at 1015. This is in between uh, first service and second service. Let me tell you the importance for that. We are going to take a vote to sell the, a portion of our property in exchange for the construction of our multi-purpose building. As you may have heard me testify this over and over again, the Lord has blessed us. Uh, you know, by bringing developers next to our property and they only want a small portion of our property in exchange. They're going to build us almost a worth of half a million a building to house our brand new youth center, uh, youth counseling center, an office for the youth pastor, an office for the food pantry director, a huge, a bigger space for our food pantry. We also have a parsonage on the second floor and also a uh, pastor's, uh, a missionary's uh, a, place of, uh, a place where they could come when on, their, on their vacation. So please make sure, and to those of you that may not be able to come and join us on that day, on the 4th of October, uh, you can just let us know so we can send you the ballot box. We would like you to participate. If you're not com comfortable of coming to the church, we just want to make sure that you don't miss out. We need a quorum on that day. So this is an exciting season. In the midst of pandemic, God is providing us with such big, big blessing. Hallelujah. Are you excited? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. And my last announcement today, of course, is that if you look on my left, left side, which is actually your right side, you can look at the Coffee, uh, Coffee Connect corner, is we do have the display for our t-shirts. Again, our resource development is just asking everyone to just be in a place of giving. They are selling t-shirts. Again, you know, you can have better shirts if you go to the mall, if you go online. I know there are other better shirts out there. Uh, but this is, this is more towards raising funds to support our missions, community outreach, and house needs and contingency. Please check out the shirts. Uh, look for Sister Gurley and Sister Esther or ask Sister Divine if you need some shirt or sign up. You don't need to pay right now. You can take, you can take 20 t-shirts, you know, and then just pay it every week. It's up to you. But we just want all of you to just, you know, support our missions because right now it's tough out there. It's really tough out there for our missionaries. Some are stuck in nations that they don't know when they're going to come out. And some, some are stuck in a place where they don't know when they're going to be commissioned because there's just no support at this point and we're sacrificing and we're just asking everyone, let's pull our resource together so that we can bless and you know, sustain our missionaries and sustain our in-house needs as well. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us bow our heads and let us pray. Father, in the name of Saint Jesus, we come before you this morning. We want to thank you once again for the opportunity, Almighty God, to honor you with our giving, with our worship. Help us to stay grateful, thankful, and appreciative for the rest of our life. Give us, Lord God, the attitude of awe of your glory and might and power. This morning, once again, we pray that in a supernatural way, would you speak to each and every one of us. Father, as you minister, Lord God, to us congregationally, would you minister to us individually, Father? Break every barriers, Lord God, in our hearts, in our mind, in every aspect of our lives. Cause us to be soft and tender and pliable, O oh God. Give us a heart of flesh. And we ask the Holy Spirit, teach us, guide us, lead us, and counsel us, and pastor us, O oh Lord God. Once again, we thank you, Lord God, that your words will never return empty and void, but it will establish the desire and the purpose in which you have sent it. We give you all the glory, and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. God is good. And all the time, praise God, hallelujah, yes indeed, He is a good, good God. I'd like you to open your Bible or turn on your e-Bible to Genesis chapter 8, starting at verse 1, we're going to read on that. I have entitled the message this morning, When the Dove Flies Back to the Ark. Will you read that with me please? When the Dove Flies Back to the Ark. 
But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heaven had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the month, seventh month, and the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, that is somewhere in Turkey. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark and set up a raven, and he kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he set up a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again set out the dove from, from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beam was a freshly plucked olive oil. All of me. <laughs> <laughs> then no one knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again. But this time, it did not return to him. Hallelujah. God bless his word. Did I say olive oil? <laughs> I must be thinking about the dove's soul. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, when God, when God decided to flood the earth due to the wickedness of men, He set aside Noah and his family and all the animals that were brought inside the ark. All in all, Noah and his family stayed inside the ark for almost a year, waiting for the water to recede and the ground to dry up. Now, I don't know how long you have been incubated, or if you have ever experienced being in one spot, in one place, for almost a year. But Noah and his family experienced this during the flood. And while the ark was floating on the water, the time uh, the, 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 the time the ground dried by the time the ground dried up, the only thing that Noah and his family can do is this to wait and wait and wait for the proper time. Say with me, wait. 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 Say with me and wait. And wait. And say with me and wait. Anyway. See, we once again, anyway. anyway. That's all they could do for almost a year. Day and night, they waited and waited and waited and waited. Now, here's the scenario. Comparing to where we're at at this point, to the time and life of Noah, there seems to be a similarity of the scenario. For Noah and his family, it was flood. For us in this generation, it's Corona. It's COVID-19. It's pandemic. We seem to be inside this, this canopy of light and art called pandemic. And we're inside the, the, this, this scenario and we are also waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the breakthrough just like Noah. What is similar with Noah and us is for them, they've never, they've never seen water fall from the sky. Never in the life of Noah and his family. You know, the, the, you know the, the earth was well balanced during the time. It was in perfect shape until sin came and distorted the universe. And it distorted nature and flood came. And for Noah to build an ark, they just didn't have any point of reference. They have never seen a boat before. They've never seen a cruise liner. They've never seen a, you know, any, any kind of floating object. And so for them, it was their first in everything. They've never seen water fall from the sky, never seen massive flooding, have never seen death all over the place. Well, look at us now. To many of us and to all of us, we have never seen what pandemic looks like. We have never seen infection by millions, and we have never seen death by thousands. It is only now, and all we can do as people of God and to all of us that are living on this earth is this. We wait, and we wait, and we wait. And we win. And there are times and season, you know, there are times and seasons in our lives when God incubates us and contains us in our spiritual ark because 
He's preparing us for the next season of our lives. I want us to understand that there are times and moments in our lives when God decides to incubate us, to cocoon us, and place us in a canopy, in a covering. Because God is preparing us for the next season of our lives. Whether that is pandemic, whether that is flood. And sometimes it could come as a sickness. Sometimes it could come as a long wait for your, for your employment. Sometimes it, you know, it's a waiting for, for a, you're, you're in an incubation period in your prayer life. Waiting and waiting and waiting for God to give you that breakthrough. And sometimes you think that nothing is going on. It's because you are in that place where you're, you feel like you're stuck. You know, you're, you're in one spot. And it's like you're inside the ark. You're just floating and floating and floating. And Noah and the rest were incubated inside the ark for almost a year. And Noah, had Noah dared to go out of the ark prematurely, it would have been disaster not only for him, but for his entire, his entire family and all the animals inside. Do you understand that there are, made, there are decisions in our lives that not only affect us, but it can affect the rest of our families? There are just certain scenarios in our lives that when we make that wrong turn, we make that wrong decision, we make that wrong move, that, of course, the full impact could hurt us personally, but many could be hurt along the way. Take, for instance, the, the life of Jonah. Jonah defied God. He received a call from God. He understood the call of God. He understood the subject of the call of God in his life. But what did he do? He defied God, went into the ship, and ran. In the middle of the oceans, next thing you know, the, you know, the ship was being shipwrecked by a huge typhoon. And waves after waves are just totally de destroying and breaking the ship. And one by one, they started just... You know, and, and just throwing all the cargoes and the animals to lighten up the load. But they just could not stop the ship from sinking until, until Jonah said, I am the issue. I am the problem. We, we can see a situation there that when we make wrong decisions at times, it could impact. And the ripple impact to that is upon one generation after generation after generation. And with Noah, it was the same. When he got out of the ark prematurely, it could have killed him all. Including all the animals selected by God. You know, that was under his custody. Now, there are times and seasons in our lives when God decides to incubate us. Because he wants to prepare us for the next life. So there are, you know, what I'm going to share to you this morning is more on the lessons about incubation season. Say with me, incubation lessons. Incubation lessons. There are lessons when God incubates you. When the Lord just kind of close all the doors and the windows and even the canopy over your life. And He says, you're going to stay here. You're going to linger here. Jesus Christ had a moment of incubation period when He went out on the desert led by the Spirit of God for 40 days and 40 nights. And God the Father incubated Him there. And what was one of the most daring, most powerful ministry to place in the desert as God was, as Jesus Christ was being dealt with in the desert. So the first lesson we can learn this morning in our incubation lesson is this. Your incubation season is your priming season. Say that with me, please. Your incubation season. Your incubation season is your priming season. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And, you know, the best thing that we can do when you are waiting and waiting and waiting, you know, is not to whine and just complain and just pout and just constantly, you know, curse. But the Word of God says that when you wait upon the Lord, this could be a season of your priming. And God is renewing you. Right, right. They shall mount up on the wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Word of God says, they that wait and wait and wait. And wait, it's not a wasted time. Right. It's not a wasted moment. You know, it says they shall renew their strength. Now, when you know how to discern the season you're in, you become wise in the way you look at life. And a lot of people don't see life in, in the proper perspe perspective, in the proper lens. It's because they can even discern the time. They think that when you know that they think that when they are incubated that they've been chained. Listen, there's a difference between incubation and someone that is in prison. And sometimes your incubation could become your prison as well because of our stubbornness. 
A mother understands, a mother understands she needs to wait nine months to become white, to be, to, for the baby to come out, of, uh, come out to reach its full maturity. Seven months, dangerous. Eight months, life and death. Six months, barely making it. Nine months, perfect. And the mother knows that waiting and waiting and waiting and just taking care of the baby inside the womb, it takes time. Sometimes it's take, it takes its toll as well on the health of the mother. But she's willing to sacrifice her life. See, when we are, when we are waiting upon the Lord, you know, God might be birthing something inside of you. And God is causing you to be pregnant with things that you've never heard, you've never felt, you've never experienced before. So learn, learn to embrace the season of waiting in your life because your incubation season is your priming season. A farmer knows what seeds he needs to plant and knows how to wait for his harvest. Do you, you understand that a farmer probably is the most, uh, is the most, uh, is the most connected individual to nature. A farmer knows Either the nature is against him or the nature is with him. He knows when the season is pretty much, uh, you, you know, uh, it, it, it's compatible to the season of planting. A farmer knows that. He could smell the air. He could sense the breeze. He could, he could touch the ground and he knows when it's the time, you know, to plant. A farmer knows how to wait because he understands that waiting is part of his harvest. You know, sometimes we look so much upon the product, but God is saying, I will give you the product, but I want you to understand this. I am also taking you into a process. I will give you what you've been waiting for in your life, he said, but you are more important than, than the product of your waiting at this point. See, I'm not only producing something out of you, I am producing a new person in you. Amen. Your incubation season is your priming season, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And God often uses our waiting season to renew His strength in us. How many you here, if, I, if you could be honest with me that you're sick and tired of this pandemic, raise up your hand. Thank you for the six and a half. I guess for the rest of you, you still want to stay inside the pandemic. Right. Let me say this once again in all honesty. Okay? Who among you here feels tired that we're still under the pandemic? Praise God. <laughs> everyone knows. Everyone knows. My goodness, you're here today, and 100 percent of you, you're wearing your mask. At least there's a smile behind those masks. Uh -huh. yeah. Welcome home. It doesn't. That is a consolation. Take that. But God often uses our waiting season to renew His strength in us. You see, brothers and sisters, Isaiah 41 is a great description for all of us. To those of you that are sick and tired of waiting. Constant flying, constant running, and constant walking make us weary and faint. And the consequences we forget, we're an eagle with a vision. The Word of God says, they that wait upon the Lord, He said, they shall mount up like wings and like an eagle. You know, you have been walking, you have been running, you have been flying, you have been toiling, you have been doing all these things. You have been multitasking for the last five, six, seven years of your life. And then the pandemic comes, you don't know how to behave because you are a go, 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 go person. There's constantly, constantly hustling and, you know, and just pressing on. And you forgot the beauty of waiting. Do you know that every time you uproot a tree, you destroy the dynamics of the, you know, of the, of the possibility that it will bear fruit? Because you are t torturing or tormenting the roots. A tree needs to be planted steady and it has to stay there so that it can take its root and be grounded and be fertilized and be nourished so that when the time comes of its priming, it will bear fruit because it is the, the, the root is ground, grounded enough to absorb a lot of nutrients and water. So your incubation season is your priming season. Always remember this, sometimes, you know, you feel like you're the raven, you're the dove, but God is saying, you know, I have never ordained you as a dove or a raven, you've always been an eagle, but the problem with you is that you've never understood what it means to wait. So you have never understood what it means to be prime. The second lesson about incubation lessons is, your incubation season prepares you for your takeoff season. Say this with me, I'm going to take off season now. Your incubation season prepares you for your takeoff season. 
And after, 40, and after 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark and set out a raven and it kept flying back and forth. Listen, and I want you to picture yourself a raven that is flying and keep flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then they sent out a dove to, set, to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there it speak was a freshly plucked olive leaf, not oil. <laughs> <laughs> then no one knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days. Look, he waited. You know, they see, they encountered the word. He waited and he waited. He waited seven more days. And sent the dove again, but this time it did not return to him. All the doves and raven, their, their, their capacity to fly is unquestionable. You know, the word of God says that during the time of Noah, they got tired of flying because they have no place, you know, to rest. And when you're a person here that is constantly, constantly on the go, you're constantly grinding, you're constantly pressing on. You're constantly multitasking. There are times and moments in your life that you feel like you're the raven. You're hovering, you're flying, but then you get tired. You no longer appreciate where you're at. You no longer appreciate the elevation that God has placed over your life because you're just tired. You have forgotten that sometimes the greatest gift and the greatest time and the greatest moment that God has ever given you is to wait. Because your incubation season prepares you for the takeoff season of your life. Let me tell you a story of my, of my own experience that I hated waiting. You know, the younger you are in the Lord, the more immature you are in your walk with God. The shallower you are in your faith, the lesser appreciation you have with waiting because there's nothing, there's nothing uh, beautiful about waiting. You know, because we have been primed and programmed by this world to keep going and going and going and going and going until the battery runs out. In the late 1980s, when I, first, when I came to the Lord in 1987 to 1990, we were part of the underground church in the Middle East. And during those three years that I was, of my immaturity and lack of understanding, lack of the will of God, uh, and then lack of, uh, you know, of discernment, I just did not enter into that prime season yet. One of the things that I hated most is waiting. Every time my pastor would ask me to come and pray with him, I would not show up. And for three years, I think I only showed up once. For three years, imagine that. My pastor asked me to pray with him. My pastor, the elders asked me to pray with them. I just did not feel like prayer is important because it's waiting. I would rather go up there in the corner of the street, passing out tracks, visiting people, praying with them. Those are all important. I did not understand that my effectiveness on the field is based on my waiting upon the Lord. And my first attempt was I wanted to go to Europe without God. And the Lord stopped me in the Middle East. And the Lord encountered me and that's where my transformation began. That was my first attempt, like a raven. The first attempt was go out there and then come back. My, my second attempt within, the, within those three years was I heard of this, of, of this uh, mother whose children are in ORU. And I approached that mother and I said, Sister Gladys, I said, I know your daughter is in ORU. How can I enroll in ORU? I never told her that my intention of going to Oral Roberts University was not really to go to school, but to make it to America. Our heart is deceptive. That was my second, my second uh, approach. And he, she gave me all the information and I was trying to get into ORU. The door was shut. I was like a raven, and I was like a dog, going out of the ark constantly, going out of the church constantly, going out of the will of God. In my third attempt, I was so gung ho to go and serve the Lord this time. And I, you know, every, every Friday when we had the service after the Friday, I would ask people to pray for me that God would commission me into the field. And one day I was riding with my, with my one of my elders and I was sharing how the Lord has been talking to me, how I wanted so much to go out there and go on full time. And as he was dropping me, my elder brother said to me, Brother Nestor, I see the God, the call of God over your life. But I just sense in my spirit, it's not yet your time. And it's incredible sometimes that we equate 
We equate, you know, when we when when our hands are empty and we're waiting as if like we're out of the will of God. And I was so angry at that elder because I, I feel like he's disrespecting the call of God in my life. And when I felt that, I hear, of course, seasons later, that's when I realized that just sensing that in my spirit, you know, holding a grudge against the brother only proves that he was right. I wasn't ready. I could not take criticism. I could not take opposition. I could not take anything that does not align with me. I just... You know, that's a sign of immaturity. If you don't know how to be broken, if you don't know how to be humbled, if you don't know how to be open to ideas of other people and inputs of other people, it was in the fourth attempt. Now, here's the difference. I forced myself out of the ark. I tried to fly myself out of the will of God. But in the fourth attempt, I was waiting in the church on an empty building, and I went after this woman of God, and I only asked her for a prayer. And she said to me, raise up your hand, brother, uh, you know, brother, he, she doesn't know my name. And as I closed my eyes, she laid hands on me in order to pray. Next thing you know, she kept quiet. And I don't know how many seconds was that, but then the word of God came forth out of her mouth. It was a prophetic word. She said, God has a lofty calling over your life. I did not force myself out of the ark. I did not flap my wings. I waited and waited and waited and God came to me. Let me tell you, if you have been chasing after God, maybe God is saying to you, I, I am everywhere, but all I want you is stay where you're at because at the proper time, I will come to you. I will allow you to see the leaves of your, of your produce. I will allow the ground to, you know, to, to, cut, to produce plants as a sign that that is your season. You know, sometimes the Lord incubates us because the field is not ready. The water is still there. And sometimes we force our sight, our, ourselves out of the will of God. And what happens? We drown. We get tired. And then we blame God. Listen. We wait. And we wait. And we wait. And sometimes we're like raven. We're excited to do things we want to do. But the ground is not right. And we get frustrated. And we get to the heart feeling like it's a death sentence. Or we feel like God has betrayed us. Then Noah sent the dove out still, could not find a dry ground and came back. The second time the dove was sent out to the dove, and the dove came back with a freshly plucked olive leaf. It's incredible. You know, one of the things we need to understand as we are in our own modern time, Noah's art is this. The reason sometimes we feel like we keep coming back to the art is because we don't see the difference between open window versus open door. Let me say it once again. The reason sometimes we feel like we keep coming back to the art it's because we don't see the difference between open window versus open door. There's a difference. The Word of God says, After 40 days Noah opened the window he had made in the ark. It was Noah who opened the window. And for me, I look at that as more like as my personal attempt on things in order to please God and please myself. I, you know, I don't concern myself with timing. I don't concern myself with the priming. I don't concern myself with the incubation. I don't concern myself with God's perfect will. You know, sometimes you, you look at your life and we're like that. You have to know when the window is open versus when the door is open. And when, when Noah opened, it's, like he, it's a picture of human attempt of trying to do the will of God. But then one day, God opened the ark. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 15, here's what it says. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring up every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground. So they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. And all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. And all the birds, everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark one kind after another. You can, can you just see the difference? When Noah opened the door, there was a lot of, uh, the window, he was, there was a lot of frustration from the doves. From the dove and the raven. It was a human attempt. 
But when he stopped opening the window and they just waited and waited and waited and waited, they began to hear the voice of God. And they began to hear the commanding of the Lord. And he said, come out of the ark. And it's incredible because as God opens up the opportunity, God opens up the seas and he opens up the door as well. Noah came out, the word of God. And then the family came next. And then in order that the animals came up. You see how order it is? When it, it's God that orders everything. When it God's that you know that when God aligns everything, when God unlocks the door of opportunity in our lives, you can really see how orderly it is. You go out and things begin to follow you. The steps of the righteous man is ordered by the Lord. Amen. Man doesn't leave. You know, man, you know, we live by faith and not by sight. And when you're looking at when you're looking through the window, you're only looking by sight. But God is saying to us. You know, you see the window, I see the door. You see the opportunity, I see my priming in you. You see the outside, but I want to see more inside of you. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, let me tell you a story about, the, you know, when someone, someone get damaged because they just didn't know how to wait. One day a man found a cocoon of a butterfly. When a small opening appeared, he sat and watched the butterfly for several hours as it struggled to force its body through the tiny hole. Then it seemed to stop making any progress. It had gotten as far as it could and could go no farther. So the man decided to help the butterfly. L listen to that. The man decided to help the butterfly. He took a pair of scissors and snipped off the remaining bit of the cocoon. The butterfly now emerged easily, but it had a swollen body and small, shriveled wings. The man continued to watch the butterfly because he expected that at any moment the wings would enlarge and expand to be able to support the body, which would contract in time. Neither happened. In fact, the butterfly spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings, it never was able to fly. Mm -hmm. What the man in his kindness and haste did not understand was that the, the, but that the restricting cocoon and the struggle required for the butterfly to get through the tiny opening were nature's way of forcing fluid from the body of the butterfly into its wings so that it would be ready to fly, fly at once it achieved freedom from the cocoon. Sometimes our struggles are exactly what we need in our lives. Listen, sometimes struggles are exactly what we need in our lives. If we were allowed to go through our life without any obstacles, it would cripple us. We would not be as strong as we would have been, and we would never have been able to fly. There is a reason when God cocoons us, incubates us, separates us, isolates us, immerses us, encloses us. He shuts the door and he shuts the window, puts us inside the ark and floating in the water, never knowing what we're going to do, never knowing we're going to be stranded, never knowing which mountain are going to land that ship or we're going to run aground in that ship. Why? It's because God is teaching us that there are times in our lives when your best friend is not the comfort of your life, but it's the struggles. Last but not the least, the three great lessons inside the ark. Do you know that the Old Testament has already been revealed inside the ark? In God's prophetic way, you would find that the three greatest lessons have already been in the, in imparted and embedded in the life of Noah. Long before there was 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians 13. And now these three remain. Read that me please. Faith, Faith. Hope, hope. And love. But the greatest of this is what? Love. love. Noah learned the three greatest lessons during his season of incubation. Listen to this. Noah learned the greatest lesson during his season of incubation. Faith. Learn, Noah learned faith during his incubation. Noah believed God and he believed and built the ark. Though he had not seen heavy clouds, flood, rain, and the gathering of many animals in his life. You know what Noah did? Noah did it anyway. Hmm. 
He has no point of reference, not any. The measurement of the art, the collection of the animals, the water spewing out of the ground, and the water coming out of the sky, the flood, no, no, no point of reference. He just don't have any idea. He just have a God's idea. And the greatest revelation to us, it's not our knowledge, our academics, and our achievements. It is God's idea. Wow. I, our ideas can just take us outside the art, but God's idea takes us to generations. And Noah at that moment, you know, it feels like it was just a chore that God is asking him to do. But inside his, you know, inside of him, God is priming and incubating and seasoning inside of him the virtue of faith. He believed on everything that God has said to him. And he was able to fulfill the will of God. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is hope. Say me hope. Oh. Noah hoped for a better future after the judgment of God upon humanity so they all waited for their better future. There were times probably when the ship, when the ark was being rocked by big, 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 big waves. And there were times probably that they felt dizzy inside that ship, inside the ark. They were throwing them. The, you know, the animals were cranky and you know, they didn't know what to do. I mean, there are times when your ark gets rocked by God. And they didn't have any compass. So what happened? It was an open-ended journey. If we go to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south, we're just going to believe that God is in control of the sky, of the water, and His ark, and our lives. They just put their hope in God. Why? It's because they are looking for a better future, and God gave that to them. After the humanity was wiped out, they were given a new lease of life and opportunity. Are you getting what I'm, what I'm saying here, people? Amen. Faith, hope, and the last thing that they have learned is love. God did not just remember no one in his family. God covenanted that he will never again destroy the earth with water. The word of God says, but God remembered no one. And all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. In almost a year, they finally came out. And the Lord not only stopped, not only stopped the flooding, dried up the ground. But he gave one of the greatest covenant ever given to humanity. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 8, he says, Then God told Noah and his sons, I solemnly promise you and your children and the animals you brought with you, all these birds and cattle and wild animals, I will never again send another flood to destroy the earth. And I seal this promise with these signs. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds as a sign of my promise until the end of time to you and to all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will be seen in the clouds. That's why we still get rain. We still get flooding. We still got... You know, at times, a huge, huge typhoon. He says that when you see, and I will remember my promise to you and to every being that never again will floods come and destroy all life. All life. That means to say, in, in global proportion, just like the time of Noah, God said, I'll never do that again. Yes, there are seasons of rain and there are seasons of winter. There are seasons of flooding, like what they're going through. You know, the southern said at this point, he said, but every time that goes through, he said, as long as you see the physical rainbow up in the sky, it is a remembrance that I promise you I will never destroy this earth again by water. Sadly, we're destroying the earth. For I will see the rainbow in the cloud and remember my eternal promise to every living being on the earth. So I hope and pray that we learn something this morning. That if the dove flies back to the ark, that doesn't mean that it's a dead end for you. God is saying, I'm not yet done. I'm not yet finished. You have not yet appre appreciated your waiting season. You have done so much of the going season and doing season of your life. You got to learn to have the waiting season, your incubation season, because it is your priming, it is your takeoff. And that's when you learn the value of the greatest lessons in life, faith. Hope and love. And by the way, these three things, they're all intangible. It's, it doesn't equate a mansion or a yacht 
or six figures or a career in New York. These are all intangible. Right. And these are all eternal. Right. And these are all inside. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads and let us pray. Father, in the name of your son Jesus, Lord, as we are waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for our own modern day pandemic, Lord God, Father, we feel like we're inside Noah's Ark. There is a reason, Lord God, because you are priming us, you're seasoning us, Lord God, you're grounding us, you're developing us, you're maturing us, you're bearing fruit in us. You're allowing us, Lord God, Father, to take off one day. And you're allowing us to learn the greatest lessons, Lord God, during this time of pandemic. So, Father, we ask and we pray that teach us just like Noah to discern the difference between an open window with an open door. Lord God, teach us, Lord God, to be an eagle, Lord God, and not a dove, and not our ark. That we don't eat, Lord God, we don't force the issue with you, Lord God. We allow the issue, Lord God, to come to you so that you can fix it for us. And if anyone will be here today, and to those that are watching with us today, I would like to encourage you, give your heart to Jesus. Jesus died for you. Jesus died so that he can forgive you of your sin and give you a new life. The word of God says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes before you. No one comes before me except through Jesus Christ. And so give your heart to Jesus. God can give you a brand new life, a transformed life. Allow Jesus to come in the incubation of your life. In the, in the waiting season of your life, give your heart to Jesus. And it's starting today. If you say, Jesus, I love you. I want to give my heart to you. Please forgive me of my sin. You can go to your room and get on your knees and ask God to forgive you. And ask Jesus to reveal himself unto you. And let me guarantee you, God is going to change and transform your life. Let's all stand up, please. Let's all receive the benediction today. Will you kindly raise up your hand with me? May the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. May He be gracious to you and show you His favor and give you peace. The Lord be with you. And God's grace and mercy be upon you all. And may you continuously appreciate the waiting season during this pandemic season and allow yourself to be molded by the priming season and incubation season of your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless us all. Hey, listen, if you just pray with someone, just, you know, say hi, hello.